Down through the years, man has been speed in the race against time. It hasn't always been easy. But there were always the pioneers. What you are about to see is an account of man's conquest of time through the air, a story of commercial aviation. This review of one nation's accomplishments parallels the common history of advancement and international cooperation of the airlines and aircraft companies of the world. In man's never-ending struggle for more time, the conquest of the air has made the clock, rather than the calendar, time's cardinal measurement. The airplane had come a long way since the Wright brothers. The Great War had hurried its development, both as a weapon and as a means of transportation. With the war's end, the lights which had gone out were rekindled, and their brightness revealed a new, turbulent, and unsettled Europe. Political, social, and economic unrest racked the continent and made ground communication inadequate and unreliable. The urgent need for a means of carrying mail and passengers provided an impetus for the formation of small, private air services in most European countries. It took a letter five days to go 250 miles from Berlin to the new Republic capital of Weimar. However, in February 1919, Germany's first regular commercial air service reduced the time to four hours. And soon there were private airline companies serving every major city in the nation. It was obvious that air service could never be restricted to within a state's borders. And agreements were reached between countries and airlines, which allowed for the opening of inter-European routes. The number of airlines multiplied, and in doing so presented a new problem. By 1924, there were over 30 airlines in Germany alone each offering limited service and facilities, and each competing disastrously with the other for the still very limited business available. And as the acceptance of air transportation grew, the small companies came together to form a major airline in each country. The principal German line was created on January 6, 1926, as a combined government and private enterprise organization under private management. The name adopted, Lufthansa. The main staple of the young airline industry was air mail, the speeding of the mails having been from ancient times a major government responsibility. The improvements in airline routes and schedules which we enjoy today were originally formulated with the requirements of efficient mail service first in mind. As hours were gained in mail delivery, the same hours were gained by the air passenger and Europeans were no longer distant neighbors. The Alps, greatest of Europe's natural barriers bypassed, and Rome brought seven days closer to Berlin. Paris now only a few hours away. And London no longer moated from her sister European capitals. The style in which the passenger was traveling began to change considerably for the better. The businessman who challenged the air to be days ahead of his competitor had put up with discomfort in order to reap the reward of the time gained. He put up with it, but he didn't like it. His discomfort became a thing of the past, however, with the introduction of the marvel of the year 1931, the Junkers G-38. Among other innovations, the only aircraft ever to have lounges in the wings, affording the passenger the same view as the pilot.
London Berlin passenger went in high style in this beauty, equipped with its own dining room, galleys, and luxury accommodations for 32 passengers. Smoking was allowed on board, and full course meals with the correct wines were offered for the first time. Travel for pleasure had become a reality. The network of airlines extended throughout Europe and continental North America. But between the two great continents, there was still the Atlantic and a time lapse of over six days on the fastest ship. Aircraft had crossed the Atlantic, but none had yet been developed to carry commercial loads nonstop. And in the vast reaches of forbidding water, there were no way stations. An early solution to this problem was devised with the aid of the famous luxury ocean liner, Europa. Air mail from Berlin was flown to Cherbourg and there transferred to the liner just before it set sail for New York. 250 miles from the American coast, a mail plane was catapulted from the deck. And landing in New York two and a half hours later, had speeded transatlantic delivery by a full day. This was a start, but the airlines could not hold themselves to the two infrequent ship schedules, and a means of carrying passengers and freight as well as mail was sought. A solution was found as direct Europe-South America service was inaugurated in 1934. Flights would proceed from Berlin via Spain to Bathurst on the West African coast. Refuel in mid-Atlantic aboard the catapult ship Westfallen and then proceed on to Recife, Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires. The first leg of the flight, Berlin to Bathurst, was flown by the record-breaking Junkers Ju-52. At that time, the workhorse of most of the world's airlines. It still remains in service in parts of the world to this day. In the port of Bathurst, British Gambia, on the westernmost land bulge of North Africa, activities were transferred to a unique seaplane, the Dornier D.O. Wall. The term flying boat was taken literally three decades ago. The wall had a watertight hull constructed as soundly as any ocean-going ship. Wings, tails, stabilizers, and two engines, one pusher, one puller, were added to the hull to make it fly. The flying boat would take off from the sheltered harbor at Bathurst heading due west for the next land, Fernando Norona, Brazil, on the easternmost land bulge of South America. Between these two points, there was only the vast Atlantic and the Westfallen, or her sister ship, the Schwabenland. Catapult ships, floating air bases, combining the principles of the drift sail and the catapult. The aircraft landed in the ocean and taxied to the ship's stern, where the drift sail had been rigged to receive it. After being made fast, the plane was hoisted aboard and placed in position on the catapult. For those on the flight, it was a chance to stretch their legs and freshen up, a pleasant and interesting interlude. For the ship's crew, it was a busy time as the aircraft was expertly checked over, refueled, and made ready for the next leg of the flight. To catapult an airship as heavy as the wall, a special device was needed, 
and this was the forerunner of the steam catapult adapted for use on today's jet aircraft carriers. The ship resembled a tanker, and it was that too, with thousands of gallons of aviation gasoline aboard for its aerial charges, as well as its own fuel supply. The ships would remain on station for a year before being relieved. Their entire purpose in being was to serve as the still needed link for transatlantic air travel. They discharged their obligations as they discharged their mighty aircraft, with skill and no little majesty. The flight continued to Fernando Noronha, and after a transfer back to a Ju-52, on to Rio and Buenos Aires. The distance covered over 9,500 miles. Flight time, four days, but a fortnight faster than the fastest ship. And greater aircraft were coming to shorten even this. Our world had grown a little smaller, and the time in Rio became more important than the date. By 1938, air travel was coming into its own as scheduled routes spanned the globe. Throughout North America and Europe, the air journey between cities became the accepted rather than the novel means of transportation. As a result of this, in an attempt to provide the world traveler with the finest in service, newer, less experienced airlines were given a helping hand. The national lines of Spain, the Soviet Union, China, and many of the South American nations owe a great measure of their development to the German airline. World speed records were established by the Focke-Wulf Condor as Lufthansa extended service eastward to Tokyo and westward to New York's Floyd Bennett Field. The airlines were winning their battle against time when time ran out on peace. The commercial lines of most of the belligerents were absorbed by their governments. German service was limited to domestic flights and flights to Turkey, Italy, Spain, and Portugal. The post-war rebuilding process put the now divided Germany 10 years behind the other nations of the world. In commercial air development, perhaps the most vital 10 years in the continuing history of man's conquest of the sky. 1955 saw the Condor insignia of Lufthansa take to the air again. Headquarters for the reborn line were established in the old university at Cologne, with Hans M. Bongers, former traffic manager of the old line, as the first president. The famous port of Hamburg, the Federal Republic's largest city, was selected as the terminal and maintenance base while Rhine Main Airport at Frankfurt became the pivot point of the rapidly expanding routes and facilities. Germany's once flourishing aircraft manufacturing plants were no longer in operation, but the American firms Lockheed, Convair, and Douglas supplied tried and proven aircraft to the fledgling German establishment. Of primary concern early in 1955 was the re-establishment of inter-German and European service. Convairs, with DC-3s as supplemental local aircraft, were the first post-war Lufthansa planes. medium-range aircraft were faster, more powerful, and had a greater load capacity than the record-breaking four-engine flagships of the previous decade. The post-war flagship, Lockheed Superstar and Super G Constellations. New York to Frankfurt, under 12 hours. 
The technical advancements of the Constellation were more than matched by the passenger accommodations. A new hallmark of travel luxury was established. On the overnight flight between the New World and the Old, the traveler was offered the finest in food, service, relaxation, and comfort. A new medium-range aircraft, the British Vickers Viscount, joined the fleets of many of the world's airlines. Its Rolls-Royce jet prop engines were the first commercial departure from the all-piston-driven airplane and an introduction to a new era, the jet age. The jetliner was over 20 years coming into being. As with many of the advances in commercial aviation, it had its inception in military air development. The first practical jet aircraft were the German Heinkel 178 and the Messerschmitt 262. Though not passenger planes, they proved the worth of the jet and inspired the development in Great Britain of the pioneer jetliner, the Comet, and in the United States of the Boeing KC-135 the aircraft which evolved into the 707. As here in Seattle, Washington, the manufacturers worked around the clock. And the mighty aircraft rolled from the assembly lines night and day. Ready for service with the airlines of the world. Now new and empty, the seats and galleys still to be installed. Engines silent, but ready to take to the air. thousand feet in the air, the jet is in a world of its own. Above the weather, smoothly without noise or vibration, it streaks across continents and oceans at 600 miles an hour, 10 miles a minute. Driven by four powerful Rolls-Royce Conway bypass engines, jutting forth from the mighty 142-foot wingspan. The jet passengers now reach their destination in half the time taken by piston aircraft. Flight time to the heart of Europe from America's west coast, 12 and a half hours. From the east coast, six and a half hours. Each 707 Intercontinental represents an investment by the airlines of over five and a half million dollars. And no line can maintain a schedule with only one jet. But consider the value of the sky giant. 
the airline can now offer the shipper same-day freight service between Europe and North and South America. And this airplane in one year will carry as many transatlantic passengers as the largest ocean liner will carry in the same period. And for the million-mile pilots who fly them, the command of this aircraft is the greatest achievement of a flying career. The 707 is now loaded and ready for departure, all 316,000 pounds of it. As impressive a sight on the ground as in the air, the Intercontinental, over half as long as a football field, moves to its takeoff position. Enjoy your jet flight. The cabin is big and during the day light and airy, with plenty of windows for everyone. There's space to move about and meet your fellow passengers. Darkness falls as you race the sun across the sky. The mood subtly changes as the soft indirect lights infuse the flight cabin with a warm and friendly atmosphere of a private club. Before dinner, there's time for a drink in the informal lounge. The bar offers a selection for the most discriminating taste. the steward will be happy to serve you at your seat. The serving table between you and your seat companion does away with the need to juggle reading material, drinks, or cigarettes on your lap. Not all the physical problems resolved in the jetliner were aeronautical. Someday, a medal will be struck to the dedicated scientist who overcame the altitude and pressurization problems involved to give the world the first draft beer ever served aboard an aircraft in flight. The rich head and golden brew give promise of a delight never quite equaled in the bottle variety. If your appetite is not thoroughly wetted by this time, the delicious aromas emanating from the two galleys will heighten your anticipation of a truly royal feast. to fill up on these delights from the buffet cart, or you'll have no room for your soup or main course. From a menu the envy of any restaurant in the world, your selection is prepared to your own special taste by master flight chefs. Your wine list is the proud equal of the menu in ensuring the ultimate in dining satisfaction.
It seems pointless to attempt to figure how many miles you've traveled between courses, but your after-dinner nap will be a brief one. In this glance back over the last few decades, we have seen man force time to change, from a jealous guardian of the hours to a liberal dispenser of ever-increasing time for leisure, business, study, and relaxation. The aircraft has been a principal instrument in this success, and the jetliner, while climaxing a half century of tremendous progress, is also the means to cross the threshold to an even better tomorrow. History is being made. Come along and be a part of it.